um, one guy contact one guy contacted us one time and he wanted the he wanted the uh, arrest on him of his marijuana bust in the Mariana, Florida. Um, and so we never we never went. But sometimes when we're going through the paper, I find a little mention of something and that just goes on to that that I sometimes do a little more work on it and Maxine is something that I, I worked on a couple of years back and then I, I found some more things and so it developed into this story. Let me go to my first slide here. Okay. There we go. As World War II took on a longer, grimmer aspect, the Pensacola New Journal newspaper announced on January 31st, 1943, that each Sunday they would produce a weekly letter of local happenings, a special compilation column of the week's events of the most important local news and society information, and it was designed for the men in the fighting forces. And they suggested that friends and others clip this column and mail it to them. On February 21st, 1943, the column of important news noted in its second paragraph that a prominent Pensacolian was taken by death during the week. Maxine, the elephant owned by W.C. Richards of the Pinehurst Tourist Camp, died Tuesday morning, apparently from a heart attack. Maxine was famous for predicting the outcome of the morning training flight of the cadet stationed at Softly Field. The 6,000-pound elephant was given a fitting funeral on a grassy knoll near her home. Well, I found that really striking. I mean, the paper reporting an elephant, so that started doing some uh, doing some research on her. And uh, Matt, uh, from what I've been able to determine, Maxine the elephant was born in India. She was an Indian elephant. That's very important. Indian elephants apparently are very docile and easy to train, whereas African elephants are very difficult to train, and they have a really um, aggressive streak in them. She was sold by the wild, wild animal importer Ellis S. Joseph in 1928 to W.C. Richards of Pensacola, Florida. At the time, she was seven years old. She weighed 820 pounds. She was loaded on the steamer Cherokee and shipped to Jacksonville, Florida, and from there to Pensacola. I don't know exactly know how she got to Pensacola. Now, W.C. Richard, Wesley C. Richard, better known as W.C., stated in an, in, an, in an interview in 1946 that his father was a showman in California, and that's how he got his middle name, Cisco, from San Francisco. Um, he told the reporter he started in the business at 15 years old, eventually organized his own show, and traveled around the country. When he says show, apparently he had some kind of a vaudeville show. I'm not being able to determine what that was exactly. But he was uh, but he was in Texas when Al Ringling told him he needed an elephant. And this began his experience in buying elephants, training them, and using them in shows. The Great Depression came along, forced him to quit traveling. And so he came to Pensacola, where he built Pinehurst Tourist Court, a tourist camp three miles west of Pensacola on Mobile Highway. We don't exactly know when W.C. or Maxine came to Pensacola. He lived in what was rural Pensacola. The weird thing about it being three miles outside the city limit, he's not in the phone books. He's not in the business directory. I can't find any 1929, 1930, 33 map that actually show a physical map showing where the Pinehurst tourist camp was. We know the bridge opened in 1929 or 28. And uh, so therefore, kind of early for tourist uh, literature. So it's been very kind of kind of thing. And uh, from newspaper account, by 1933, Pinehurst Tourist Court was Maxine the Elephant's winter home. This tourist court, by the way, had cabins, had cabins, and people would would rent it, uh, rent the cabin when they visited Pensacola. And that was her home. W.C. would train her, teach her new tricks, and during the summer and early fall, Maxine would travel with truck circuses. Occasionally, W.C. would drive her to destinations or bring her back home and visit, or visit the circuses to see if she was all right and revisit old time with show friends. When she came back to Pensacola, it was frequently announced in the newspaper, just like this article here, 
and then he would invite the children to come to the uh, come to the tour camp to see Maxine, and maybe she would do a little little act for them. She was very intelligent, very friendly, and she loved a human. Now, by 1933, Maxine weighed 2,500 pounds. On March 21st, she was being taken back from San, San, San Antonio, Texas, back to Pensacola by truck. The truck broke down in Gulfport. Maxine was able to escape from the truck. And as the new paper accounts in four different states reported, with nothing else to do, Maxine lumbered across the coast delta in search of excitement. Things were growing rather dull until the patchy derm caught sight of Peter Theory, a Mississippi coast painter and decorator inspecting screen near Henderson Point. Diverted, the elephant made an unsolicited attempt to join in the inspection. Theory resented the intrusion. Shoo, he said, waving his arm to indicate he resented the elephant's proximity. Maxine, untutored in the rudiments of etiquette, ignored the rebuff. Shoo, Theory repeated with some em emphasis. Well, now, one shoe was all right, but two of them disturbed Maxine's us usual placidity. With Evie precision, she thrust out her trunk, casually picked up Theory, talking about 40 feet away. Now, Theory suffered only a leg bruise, but he told this story for years, and it was reported the trainer came up soon after and led him back to the truck. And this is the article from the Gulf and the Jackson, Mississippi paper about that attempt, and I had a headline from the Birmingham News, too, so it was quite a, an adventure. Now, they got the truck fixed, and they started to repent for Colin. But when they made it to Biloxi, it was raining. The truck did it at an intersection, throwing Maxine against the side of the truck and breaking the body out of the truck. The Macon, Georgia newspaper reported that it took a day to repair the truck, and many in Biloxi were startled to see an elephant by the side of the road. The paper reported this was her first visit to Biloxi, and Maxine stated that if the weather were better and there were more peanuts available, she'd like to stay longer. Although the new paper, Central newspaper called this a stampede in Gulfport, Maxine nevertheless performed wonderfully several days later at the Pinehurst Tourist Camp at a park, stag party held for the Fleet Reserve Association Branch 22. Three Navy chiefs, to prove that the Navy feared no man nor beast, tried to climb on her back, but the paper reported that the little girl gently but firmly tossed them off. Now, during the summer and fall and winter of 1933, Maxine toured with the K Brothers Wild Animal Circus, where she was billed as Maxine the Singing Elephant, Maxine the Dancing Elephant during their New England tours. And this is one of the poster uh, from that circus showing Maxine. Among the city you visited were Glen Fall, New York, uh, Glen Falls, New York, Meridian, Kent, Connecticut, and Fort Lauderdale because they traveled through the Northeast, New England, and then they worked their way down the coast to Florida. And uh, this is a picture of the uh, from the ad from the K Circa from uh, New York and from Hollywood, Florida, uh, showing Maxine. Um, in other words, your your circus traveled, but you needed a star, and the, having an elephant was was the idea of the star. And um, the Pensacola paper reported her of her coming home on March 16, 1934. And she returned to the K Brothers Circus again in 1934. And W.C. Richard was driving her to Concord, Massachusetts, when an axle broke on his truck in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. And while the truck was being repaired, he put Mac, had Maxine put on a show for the neighborhood kid, where she danced, played the mouth organ, and other tricks. The Pottsville paper called it, His Misfortune with the Kid, Good Luck. And I was able to locate the picture of the K Brothers Circus uh, traveling uh, on the road. So they were truck circuses. Uh, sometimes they performed out in the open. A uh, few may have had tent, but that took an awful lot of uh, travel and so forth. During 1935, Maxine toured and performed with the Barney Circus. She was billed as the largest elephant in captivity, bigger than the famed Jumbo. She traveled throughout the Midwest, including Iowa, North Dakota, Arkansas, and Missouri. She returned to Pensacola 
uh, on November 19, 1935, and held a party for the children at the Pinehurst Church Camp on Sunday afternoon, November 24th. By now, the 800-pound elephant that Richard had purchased weighed 4,300 pounds. Every year, the same thing repeated. Maxine would winter at home in Pensacola, travel with the circuses, learn new tricks, learn tricks, and uh, endear herself to circus uh, trainers, children, circus people, and many others. And these are photographs of some of the uh, of Maxine performing that I was able to locate in a Wisconsin uh, historical museum. Maxine would often walk this very skinny plank or she would uh, stand and balance on, on different things. The, um, she credited with saving three lives during her lifetime. Once in northern Tennessee, the truck in which she was being transported fell 50 feet into a river. Maxine battered her way out of the rear compartment, swam up to the cab, burst open the door, and she carried the half-drowned driver up to the bank, surviving a party of picnickers. Once at the tourist camp, a keeper fell asleep with a cigarette in hand. Pretty soon, a pile of hay nearby was in flame. Maxine picked up the keeper, talked him 20 feet out of danger, broke her own chain, and beat it for safety. A third rescue occurred on circus ground, and it was a, concerned a four-year-old girl. There were fire trucks beating past the circus ground, and she ran from her parents into the line of the elephants, and Maxine picked her up and lifted her 10 feet in the air with her trunk, preventing her from being crushed from other elephants. What made Hall Maxine such a national ph phenomenon was her hallmark was uh, as a hallmark of a circuit was that she they visited very small towns and rural areas. They would only have one elephant and she could garner affection by her charming folk with their tricks and friendliness. She was extremely intelligent. She had actually had a mind of her own and the Mill Brothers Circus has have her painted on the side of their trucks as, as they traveled. And you can see they actually had a tent in their ad in uh, Warrington, Missouri newspaper uh, called her Maxine the Elephant with the Human Brain. And this is another ad from them. There are different circuses. And uh, so uh, Mr. Richard would would travel to some of these circuses to talk with one some of his friends in the circus, check to see how she was getting along and so forth. Now, I said she had a mind of her own. Well, in March 1941 in Baton Rouge, the trainer decided to tease her by holding out a half a loaf of, br a loaf of bread with sniffing distance, but just out of reach. Probably wasn't the first time Maxine had developed a grudge against him. What the trainer didn't know is that Maxine had figured out how to get out of her chain. But when he waved the bread, she got mad, trumpeted, stepped from her chain, slapped him neatly across the face, and wandered off. She wandered, uh, she began ripping board from a nearby garage. I think she was mad, okay? And finally, the trainer apologized and led her back to the stall, and the circus owner, John R. Ward, had to pay for the damage to the garage, and he also invested in newer and stronger chain. The story was reprinted in a number of Louisiana newspapers and Florida newspapers. And I like this one with the best headline, Maxine gets tough and cost the boss several greenbacks. From the fall of 1941 to 1942, most of 1942, she toured with Jay Gould Circus. The Jay Gould Circus emphasized a clean circus they performed primarily outdoors with no need for tents. Maxine was the star of the show, and in rural town, the circus would issue a a uh, a challenge to any tractor dealer to the to tractor dealers with new tractors in a tug of war with her. Um, and uh, I actually have a picture of that one. This is one where she her tug of war with a group of local kids come and, and play tug of war with with Maxine. The interesting thing about Jay Gould's circus and also the Mill Brothers circus, they are forerunners because what they decided to do, they decided to seek sponsorship of local organization for fundraising. And so they would come to a town and it, they would be sponsored by some local charity or organization. The picture with the young kid, for example, uh, is an orphan home uh, actually a, a local orphan home. So 
Well, the circus was a clean circus. There were a number of papers that reported how clean the circus was. It wasn't that they didn't have the a gambling game. They didn't have uh, rough looking car carnies and and things like that. And that was really a new new uh, thing for circus management. Now, she was part of the circus for the Soybean and Corn Festival in Gibson City, Illinois, in early October 1941. And she was at the Old King Coal Festival in West Frankfort, Illinois. That's way down at the southern tip of Illinois, where the, a lot of the coal mining is done in mid-October. And she was named the elephant mascot of the festival. However, the last night, the evening before the circus was to close, she got loose from the circus. And she wandered a block away where she found a feed store owned by a man named John Miss Savage. She pushed in the doors and, according to the owner, consumed a great amount of feed. The owner demanded that the police arrest her, which they did, and leading to headlines in Illinois and Kentucky newspaper about what to do with a four-ton prisoner in the city jail. And she was released once, uh, once the owner circus owner had had fed uh, had had paid the owner uh, for the damage to the door and and the food. One of the events that was staged during the circus run in 1942 was the surprise birthday party with Maxine, celebrating Maxine's 23rd birthday, often held for the children, and she frequently participated in the circuit parade and held in many of the rural community. Um, and this is a picture I found of her at the circus. The interesting thing I find about it is that uh, there's not much of a barrier before, between Maxine and the audience. And here she is actually stepping over either a trainer or a young child. So it's part of, part of the act, something that, something that parents would never let their kid do today. Now, the interesting thing, in 1944, I found a Clarkville, Tennessee newspaper. They had stories about men in service. And one of them said that he had, that before he joined up with the military in February 1943, he had been an elephant trainer with Jay Gould's circuit. And he had, he'd only had one accident with an elephant, and that elephant was Maxine. He and Maxine teamed up in a head-carrying act, and she slipped, cutting his head and leaving two scars on the back of his head, he said. He was ready to do the trick again the next night, but it took two weeks to convince Maxine that the trick was safe. She was too nervous to try it. He told Maxine that he often fed, he told the paper that he often fed Maxine bottled soft drink, and she'd drink straight from the bottle. And one night in Sparta, Illinois, she crashed the crew beer party and drank from a great deal from an open keg of beer. Marston said they kept giving her more and more beer until she began staggering around, silly drunk. He told the paper she probably had quite a hangover with dreams of pink men. Maxine, 1942, season closed when the Jay Gould Million Dollar Circus ended its season at Mount Carmel, Illinois, on October 7, 1942. Billboard magazine reported that they had toured for 20 weeks, played in 60 towns. Forty members of their company had entered the armed forces. This was just six months after Pearl Harbor. And Maxine had her yearly birthday party for children, with children bringing scrap metal, which resulted in a large pile on the lawn of the county courthouse. Maxine returned to her home in Pensacola for the winter. Now, in Pensacola, the pace of training for naval aviators increased during the early 1940s, substantially after Pearl Harbor. Each morning, the naval cadet would be taken by bus from Softly Field, traveling up Mobile Highway to the field where they held practice. The cadet would see Maxine outside every morning as they went by this tourist camp, and they would yell to her. They would yell and wave to her, and they discovered that as she lifted her trunk, their trunk at them and gave a little trumpet, they would receive up checks that day, which were in, in the... Uh, uh, and naval aviation meant you did all the things correctly. You landed correctly. You read the instruments. We passed your test and all that. But they discovered that she didn't lift her trunk. And she turned around and they placed her posterior toward the bus. They would have a bad day. Oh, they're, they're, they, would, they would fail this. They would fail, get bat down checks. So, so the naval aviator, she became their flight barometer. 
When Maxine died suddenly on February 16, 1943, of a heart ailment, new papers in Pensacola, Tampa, and St. Petersburg noted there was gloom at Softly Field. Now, owner C.R. Richards offered her 6,000-pound carcass to the Red Cross as a contribution for their national campaign for facts and oil, but they declined because they, they were unable, they, they just didn't have the lack of facility for, for, for doing this. Well, Richard told Billboard Magazine he had, he'd had Maxine for 19 years. She weighed 800 pounds when he originally got her. Richard had carpenters, union carpenters, build Maxine coffin. It was 18 feet long, 12 feet wide, 14 feet deep. She was buried on a grassy knoll at or near Pinehurst Tourist Camp with a tombstone and fenced in. At the paper reported, roses will adorn her grave as they were her favorite flower. She once pulled up 20 rose bushes that had been brought from Texas for the Richard lawn and had eaten them, a briars and all. And that is why the paper reported her death, her prominent Pensacolian, and her death in 1943. Now, you may think that's the end of my story. It's a good story, a wonderful album. It's a cute story, but it's not quite the end of the story. The story of Maxine inspired Elizabeth Dean, wife of Lieutenant Commander A.M. Dean of the United States Navy, who was stationed here, to write a story about Maxine set at the tourist camp. It's a fiction story, but tells about the daily bus, the Navy cadets, their hope of Maxine blessing for a good day. Maxine and the Marvelous Babe was published in Collier Magazine on October 16, 1943. And although it's fiction, it incorporates key details about Maxine as well as her love of roses in a romantic tale where the elephant helps a naval aviator realize that his dream date is not at all a dream. This led to another story, Maxine and the Pretty Bauble, which appeared in Saturday Evening Post on November 17, 1945. Again, said admit Maxine, again, using Maxine and her life at the tourist camp, which in the book, is, uh, in the magazine, is called Navy Nook. And a final story about Maxine appeared in the American magazine in May of 1948, titled Operation Shiny. Tale of a naval cadet, the girl he loves, the father who disapproves, and an elephant that helped put out his car fire bank makes off with his shiny cap. Richard required a trained other elephant, but had sold them all by 1948. He, did he died in 1950, but a new paper interview makes it clear that Maxine had been his favorite. Thank you. That's great, Dean. Thanks. Isn't that an interesting story? Thank you, Zine. That was great. And uh, it's just uh, it's just a darling it's just a darling story. And uh, you know, I mean, it, she just she was just famous in in Pensacola. Now, the strange thing is, I don't know where this turf camp is, and I have ideas of um, one of the Judy Benson's archaeology students come running in one day and say, "We we found we found a mastodon in in Pensacola." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it mentions the tombstone. It makes me wonder if it's still out there somewhere. That's what I wondered too. Or somebody found it and didn't know what it was. I, I don't know. I don't have a picture of the tombstone. Not been able to find anything else on it. Uh, Richard died in 1950, pretty far back. Um, and um, and I couldn't find the he and his... Uh, he, I think he did have a son, but I look like from what I could determine, his son, his son was killed in in, in World War II. Um, I'm not totally positive on that, but anyway, I've been tracking. Like I say, I've been tracking Maxine all through the paper. the The hard thing about searching the Pensacola paper is that um, we have a very we had a very very famous family at that time in Pensacola, very high society family. And uh, and the daughter's name was Maxine. 
And what find these articles headline, you know, Maxine debuts at party. Okay, and it wasn't the elephant. He 